So I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I think we have the majority of our filmmakers here, and um, yeah, we'll start our conversation. So good evening. Um, it's always weird because this virtual space. I'm still very new to um, having you all in the room and then having a virtual audience as well. But I just want to say good evening to everyone. Uh, welcome to the 17th annual Oxford Film Festival and the This Is America Narrative Short Block Q and A. Um, real quick, my name is Tabby Moyo, and I am the Workforce and Production Manager at the Mississippi Film Office, where I work closely with Nina Parikh, the Director of the Mississippi Film Office, to create opportunities for filmmakers in Mississippi, and we also work closely with productions that come to the state once they've decided to film in Mississippi. We help them find location, cast, and crew, and also apply for our incentive program. Um, the other thing that I, I, I am also the founder of the Independent uh, Black Film Collective, which is an organization that is still in its infancy, but the goal is to deepen the engagement and integration of Black filmmakers into film communities that presently exist, which is this, the film festivals, industry conferences, labs, and connecting them to funding sources um, that are out in the world. I'm so excited <laughs> to be here with each of you. Um, we have some amazing <laughs> Um, um, I need the mic. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, when well, you're not speaking, um, so we have some amazing filmmakers in the room. Super excited to be here with you guys to find out what inspired some of your short stories uh, and hopefully answer some of the questions um, that the audience has. I, I imagine we have a lot of emerging filmmakers in the audience. So some of my questions will be specifically kind of geared to them to get into your minds and your brains as filmmakers to help them inspire. So before we get started, I would love to go around the room and get to know everybody a little bit better and make sure I know who's connected to what film. So if you could, I'm going to start in the, the corner, just get, tell me your name. Um, the film that you're connected to, um, where you're currently based, and what you do when you're not creating films. So Yoshi, we can start with you. Hi everyone, my name is Yoshi James. I am a photojournalist and video producer for the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper. So I'm currently based in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I am the director and editor of Singing for King. It's a short documentary film looking at the Prairie View a and University Choir. And they had a chance meeting with the late civil rights icon, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee over 50 years ago. Thank you for having all of us here, I appreciate it. Absolutely. And thank Melanie. Shout out to Melanie Addington, who's been pivoting in this um, quarantine coronavirus world that we're living in now uh, and continuing the Oxford Film Festival. So shout out to Melanie for doing an amazing job and, and getting us all into this space uh, tonight. Katrina, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi there, I'm Katrina Blair. Um, I'm the director of uh, Pain and AV by Ben Owner Guap, who's with us. <laughs> um, and uh, when I'm not making my own films, I work as an assistant camera on sets for other films and reality TV and things like that. Um, oh, and I'm based in Jackson City. And happy to be here. <laughs> Ethan, how about you? I'm Ethan, I'm uh, based in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, I made the uh, short documentary, Lou. It's about uh, Louisiana Petway Bendoff, uh, one of the younger generation of G's Bend quilt makers out of uh, G's Bend, Alabama. Um, and I am very, very lucky to uh, make short documentaries for a living for various organizations. I just work freelance and I'm super grateful and honored to be here. We're happy to have you. Is it Daquan? Yes, Daquan. Daquan, okay. Hi, how are you? Um, so my name is Daquan Collier. Um, I'm the director of What If Black Boys Are Butterflies, and I'm based in New York, um, specifically Brooklyn. Um, and last, oh, I, I work at a production company and I'm not making films. Awesome. Can you, what's the synopsis of um, what if black boys were butterflies? 
Um, it's a short experimental film, basically um, centered around a conversation between two black men and kind of reimagining and what black boyhood is and um, what it could be. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. Hi guys, my name is Yas Canley. I'm the director of Man and Hoodie, and I'm based in LA right now. And what I do when I don't direct is uh, everything else in the entertainment industry. I do acting, I do modeling, I do voiceover, uh, all the good stuff. It sounds I'm super happy to be here too. We're happy to have very you. Honored. Very honored. Uh, Shamar. Uh, unmute yourself. <laughs> bad. My bad. I'm sorry. I have to unmute myself. Hi, Yaz. Your hair looks great, by the way. <laughs> I'm just saying, girl. Anyway, I, hi, guys. I'm Shamar Philippe. I am based in LA, and I am part of the film Men and Hoodie. And when I'm not um, creating films, I'm consuming creativ creativity, art, music, TV shows, movies, all of that. Awesome. Yeah. Ben Rana? Squap. Hey, how you doing, man? It's Ben Rana Guap. Uh, currently, I'm in uh, Grenada, Mississippi. Um, I'm CEO of iMob Entertainment and Ben Rana Gang. And I have two videos, Pain and AV. Awesome. I think we I, we may have lost someone. When they join us again, I'll um, I'll bring them into the conversation. I'm going to go ahead and get started because 60 minutes passes by so quickly. And I know there are a lot of people joining in um, that hope to be inspired by some of the things that you all share. Everybody does amazing things. Um, sounds like a lot of people wear a lot of hats and I'm interested uh, to know a lot more about you all's process. So just real quick, how many people, um, was this your first film project? Was it anybody's first time? Make it sound awesome. Okay. Okay. Just to kind of get my first one. You did really good, Shamar. I really enjoyed Man and Hoodie. That you killed that role. <laughs> um so just in general to the filmmakers, um, the writers, directors, um get the conversation started. Was there a particular time like in your life when you decided or recognized that filmmaking wasn't just gonna be a hobby? And can you tell me about that? Like the moment that you realize, oh, I want to be a filmmaker. And that's for anybody in the room. Um, well, I can answer that. Um, and it actually has to do with the Oxford Film Festival because my mom brought me when I was like really young and I was always just so inspired by the films that I would see there. And I was like, yep, this is a path that I'm taking in my life and now we're here, so. <laughs> What about for anybody else? Was there a particular time when you realized, hey, this is what I want to do for life? I want to, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, wow. You know, here I go. Um, one time I went to a trip to Colorado last year, 2019, on my birthday. Okay. And Colorado is not many Black people there. So during my trip, all of the people that, 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 that live there, they thought I was famous because I was the only Black guy there for like a week. So I'm not famous. Uh, I wasn't at the time. I wasn't at the time. Okay. Yeah. So you know, and just the fact the way that they was presenting, you know, the way they was addressing me and how they was treating me or whatever, it made it just opened my eyes and made me want more. When I came back, I decided when I made it back to Grenada, Mississippi, I decided that I was gonna do music. Awesome. And. Real quick, let me put a pin in. I see that Megan has entered the room and I want to make sure we get her intro. So Melanie, I mean, Megan, can you hear me? Yes, okay. I can hear you. <laughs> so yeah, so just um, tell us where you are, uh, where you're based currently and the film that you're connected to and what you do when you're not uh, making films. I apologize, I'm having a really bad thunderstorm here. So it's been in and out. So hopefully I won't lose connection again. But um, so I'm connected to Man and Hoodie. Um, I am based in New York, but I've been doing work between New York and LA. And when I'm not um, in film, I've often bartended. Um, uh -oh. I'm floating around right now. So hopefully I'm gonna end up in LA. Awesome. Um, so 
keeping the kind of the conversation going, I want to um, go to Ethan really quick and ask a question about your film. One of my first questions that I, I, I had after viewing it is, how did you get those older Black women so comfortable in front of the camera? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question, actually. I... Um... It helped that, uh, that was the, I will say, I will add, that was the first time I had met um, uh, the older black women that were there. I had talked to Lou a few times because she was doing a re an artist residency um, at a place called Serenby, south of Atlanta. Um, I think what probably, it probably had nothing to do with me. I think they've just been on camera enough. <laughs> there, I was not the first one to make a film about yeah. them for sure well, those I ladies have definitely been singing on camera and have had people like the new york times come by like it's a super rich story yeah. and and i love the fact that your story celebrated that history and that heritage um i've, I've heard of uh, the women in these band and seen some of their quilts um it was shot really really beautifully as well since we're you know kind of on your film right now i'm curious to know can you talk a little bit about uh, what your production process, how you kind of chose to do, use the portraits and the junk, your own shots. And it was shot really beautiful. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Oh, thank, thank you. That's so kind. Thank you. Um, I have been making short documentaries just sort of as a one man band for a really long time. And uh, I had a boom mic in an awkward stand right over them as they were making that quilt, the three of them, the three generations. Um, uh, we were there, I believe, just one afternoon and then the next morning. And um, it was raining the first afternoon. So I was, I think I had my drone up in the air right when it started pouring. And uh, I was narrowly able to, I know any, anyone that does drone stuff knows that you're just, you have no idea if you're gonna lose your drone at any point. Um, and I've crashed it multiple times, but um, the part when she was talking about the river because the river for those of you who haven't seen it it's it's a bend in the river that's why they call it g's bend and so these generations of families grew up isolated very very like uh concretely isolated from the rest of that region of alabama um and the river was such a huge part of that region and yet they didn't really they never went near it in a way. And so I knew that I needed to get up above and to sort of show physically the isolation there and how, and which, which then makes it even that much more impressive how they created these insane works of contemporary art when these ladies never, they never studied art history. They never, you know, they never studied art, but they are some of the most important southern contemporary artists of the 21st century i would agree with that for sure um yeah it, it's pretty amazing how um i think even before that i think i was always impressed with quilts you know i never knew why but hearing stories like that helped me understand you know the the art in it um so heads off to you you did a great job with with that film um and I'm curious to know, just kind of talking about process, uh, I want to go to Katrina um, uh, and you guys with AV and both pain. Can you all talk about a little bit of, to talk a little bit about the process that you all, that went into making that film? It was um, equally shot beautifully. Um, what was that process like? Like how long did it take you? Um, and Ben Ron, I'm interested, you know, what inspired you to make those films? I mean, or make those songs? So Katrina, let's start with you about process. Okay, well, thank you. Um, actually, uh, Ben Runner and I have met um, on the set of another film that was shooting in Mississippi that I was working on. And um, he was looking for someone to shoot his music videos. And um, we kind of just started talking from there and met um, a couple times before we shot about like what we were gonna do for a wardrobe and like what kind of vibe we wanted each of the um, videos to have. And I mean, he's got a bunch of great ideas. So we, we pretty much just went with whatever he wanted and showed up there and shot what it was. So <laughs> it was fun. We had, we had a good time. 
did you work with mainly, um, uh, you, who did you work with in Mississippi? Was it all Mississippi-based crews? Did you have some new people work with you? Is it you, your normal team? Um, we had uh, some, a couple friends come up from uh, Hattiesburg and help, um, but it was, we kept it pretty small, really. Um, it was a lot of our friends and family that just helped shoot it. So it's pretty small production. <laughs> And Ben Runner, Ben Runner, how how what inspired uh, you to make those those songs? Okay, uh, well, pain, pain. I shot first. Uh, pain is basically just a, a story about my life before today, mm -hmm. like um, just showing my experience, what it was like to be a foster child, uh, my experience growing up without my mom or my father in the picture. Uh, my brother is currently incarcerated. Just, just things that affected me growing up, you know. And you know, I thought now that I'm, I don't say I'm past it, but um, now that I've matured, once I've grown from it, I, I, I decided to share it. And AV, AV, um, I had a sponsor. Um, shout out to my sponsor, Artist Valky. I go check it out. Um, uh, he just, you know, basically the uh, owner just saw I was a. Uh, basically, at the time he had like two songs. He just saw I was hard working, and he he gave me a piece of me an idea. He was like, "Hey, you know, if you can make this song for me, if you can make a song about my brand, my liquor, whatever, and you know, people like it, whatever, we, we can we can work." And I did that in like less than a week, and. And we went from there. We shot, hooked up with Katrina, like she said, saw on a couple of shoots and made that happen. Awesome. Both the, the projects were, were super strong. I really enjoyed uh, both of those videos. Yeah. Later, I want to ask, um, I think, oh, we don't have the filmmaker that I wanted to ask, just about like product placement and, and finding opportunities like that and, and how those things work out. But before we get go back to that, I want to put a pin in that and ask Yoshi um, a, a question about your film. Um, so I don't know how often, you know, when we're dealing with the civil rights movement that we see your type of story, right? We see usually boots on the ground, marches, um, and we hear from those voices. So I, for me, it was really refreshing to um, see the story from the perspective of the, the choir, the Prairie View Choir. Um, can, you, can you tell me, how did you find that story? How did you decide that that was a story you wanted to tell? Thank you very much. We were, we as in Memphis, we were getting ready to commemorate Dr. King's, the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's assassination. Mm -hmm. And so our investigative reporter at the Commercial Appeal newspaper in Memphis, Mark Perisquia, happened to hear this man on a radio show talking about performing for Dr. King. <laughs> and then he got in touch with uh, a TV station in New York who had the footage. At the time there were European filmmakers following the Poor People's Campaign. And this is right before the birth of PBS. And they were documenting Dr. King's movement in the South. And Mark happened to find this one choir member and he gave him information about other surviving choir members so we interviewed, did, did pre-interviews with them and flew to Houston, Texas and Columbus, Ohio to interview some of the choir members. Mm. That's an amazing story. I thought you all, that was just super refreshing and um, informative, you know, and just a great way to learn about the movement and people who were affected by the movement. Um, college students, you know, specifically that perspective, that, that was, um, Pretty fascinating to me. So, so heads off to you all. Um, and it, what's interesting about that as well is just hearing how you came up on the story. And, and just for the filmmakers who are listening and joining in, stories come from everywhere. You can be inspired. You just never know where you're going to be inspired or find stories. And I just want you know, kind of uh, telling that that bit of of how she found her story to to kind of you know give people thinking. You know, especially if you're still you're out there struggling and you're trying to figure out what story to tell, whether you're a documentary or a um, narrative uh, filmmaker, stories are everywhere. I'll, you know, always be open to be inspired. And, and that's what um, that, that's what I got from that. That great job. Um, so let me um, 
I'm just going to kind of go keep going around the room and talking to uh, all the filmmakers about your projects. Um, let me go to Daquan, Daquan uh, and talk about uh, this beautiful piece of, of, of created such a beautiful piece. And I had so many, um, not necessarily questions, but just kind of thoughts. And I was inspired after, after seeing uh, your film. So my question, um, one of my questions is, was the script based on a real conversation? No, I, I wrote the script. Okay. And um, can you talk uh, about how you decided the images, that, the imagery that you would show in, in this, in the, in your film, um, why the subjects were wearing the white tees and the, and the jeans, and what the takeaway, kind of what, what are you hoping the audience takes away or walks away with after seeing um, your mm -hmm. film? So I think um, my goal in it was like having this intimate conversation of like two Black men who would typically wouldn't be opening up to each other, you know, talking about this idea of freedom in boyhood. Um, so I feel like um, like often boy, um, Black boys don't have the freedoms that other, you know, children have. Um, well, Black women as well, but, you know, the freedoms to like enjoy childhood in the same ways. Um, so I think the goal I kind of had was like, the longing for freedom in these images and showing like, you know, the boy or the guy running in the field, like carefree and like the kids playing on the beach, like this like, idealized version of like what it should be. Um, and then like kind of what it is, like the kids fighting, um, play the slap out thing in the street and stuff like that. And I picked the white, like the white tees and the, and the jeans kind of like, so everybody kind of looked in the homogenized slate and just like this pureness um yeah i think that and yeah i think people i want people to take away like people who don't even experience this to show like to know that this experience is like a rare thing like yeah, we want to we want the same things as everyone else to be able to freely enjoy these things yeah it definitely um drew on my emotions um you know the poor um, and just the emotions. I think you did a great job capturing um, kind of the perfect images, just the perfect images for the words. Um, yeah, it definitely um, sparked, uh, I mean, it just struck a chord with me. So uh, I'm not sure if anybody in the room saw it, but it was a beautiful piece, beautifully done. Um, and so now um, I have, I'm sorry, I'm flipping through my pages, Man and Hoodie. Uh, I think the last three in the room are connected to Man and Hoodie. Okay, so I think your film hits the nail on the head when it, when we consider the theme of, of this shorts block, right? Considering all the layers that come along, and I'm just gonna read what I wrote um, initially and, and, and I'll land on a question, but considering all the layers that come along with, and thinking about the character um, that come along with being black in America now, and in your film, it's combined with the complexity of this interracial couple who's struggling with addiction. So my question to you all is what came first? Was it the story or the character? And, and what was the process of developing either of those like? Um, I would say the, the story came first um, because throughout the film, there's a lot of things that happened that I personally have experienced. Um, I've been in that relationship, I've had that girlfriend. She wasn't white, but she was black at the time. I thought it would be interesting yeah. to make it um, drive the point home more. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, because it makes the relationship even more complex because now it's like, it's no longer about just, oh, two people fighting like at, at the store or whatever, or in their home and the neighbors are knocking on the door. It's now an interracial couple. And now it's like, oh, they might call the police. It has it adds stakes, you know. It, it it makes it higher. So the story definitely came first. Um, um, I'm sorry, I didn't get the second part of your question. What was that? No, I, and I was talking about the, the you're talking about it now. Just the process, the development. Oh, okay. Of, of um, oh, right on, right on. Changing the story to make it more complex and make it a little bit the stakes higher, essentially. Right, 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 right. So you um, and thank you for your compliment earlier. I didn't, I didn't, I was mute and I was like, ah, I'm trying to say thank you, but you know. <laughs> It's totally fine. And Yaz and Megan, can you talk about the process for you um, as you learned about the story? And now, uh, Shamar, you're the writer. And let me yes. get everybody. And then Megan and Yaz, tell me your positions on, 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 on crew. So I'm the director and Megan is the producer. 
Okay. Okay. So tell me what drew you to the story uh, initially and, and yeah, your connection with Shamar. Sure. So um, I was introduced to Shamar through a mutual friend who said, hey, I have this super talented guy and he's looking, he wrote this thing that he wants to film and he's looking for someone that can direct this because he's been trying to find someone and it wasn't really this, the right match. And I was like, okay, you know, I'll talk to him. And so we sat down and, um, well, he sent me the script and it was, I think, kind of like a draft that he still wanted to kind of work on. So I, I, I read it and I saw a lot of potential and a lot of depth in it. Um, so I, and we met up and we talked and we exchanged a few notes back and forth. And I basically was like, hey, it was so great to meet you. And, you know, um, I gave him like my two cents of what I thought uh, the script could, uh, could, um, could elevate it even more. And uh, I said, you know, good luck with this. This is really amazing. And I left. And the next day he emailed me and said, uh, here are the notes that we talked about. And here's the new draft. And I was like, wow, this guy, <laughs> he's for real. Yeah. Like he wants this. And that is what inspired me immediately because I'm, I'm a go-getter and I'm a hustler and I, I work really hard. And seeing his passion and his drive and his motivation got me super inspired. And, yeah. and for some reason, just I was creatively so drawn to it because the, the story and the depth of the themes were all there. That was all coming from Shamar, which allowed me to bring all of the visual and the audio and, 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 and the filmmaking elements and let me be creative in that part. So it was a beautiful collaboration with, with him and me in that sense, I felt like. Um, and, uh, you know, the character, he, he knew so much about the character already because some of it was drawn from his own life. And then the stuff that we added as like the character character, him and I broke down really easily and very quickly. And, and uh, we took it even a few steps deeper, I think, um, to then what you see on the film, what ended up being on the film. That did an amazing job. And um, Megan, did, did you have something to add to that? And then I'll have a, a kind of a general question uh, just about re building relationships, collaborations, because filmmaking is such a collaborative um, team effort. Uh oh, take yourself off mute. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, if I'm breaking up too much, please tell me because it's kind okay. of going in and out. So cool. am I good? Yeah. yeah good. Okay. Um, I would just say, awesome. I would just say that um, for me, I, um, I think that the, the funny thing is like thinking of America and what it is today, um, as far as uh, feeling like we can be ourselves and, and, and be powerful people. And I was raised um, in Detroit and then moved to New York. And there was something that touched me so much about this story, this idea of someone literally limiting themselves and their power because they're trying to um, appease or make other pe people feel comfortable. And something about that just really struck a chord for me. Um, and I think still, you know, it rings so true. And, and after meeting Shamar, actually, I met him the first day on set um, and just immediately was like, uh, or maybe it was the day before, but immediately was like, <laughs> so um, enamored by this was his story and, and not completely, but parts of it were really inspired by his life. And this is true for so many people. And I, you know, I'm inspired to tell more stories like this. And I, I, I think that this was probably one of the most beautiful um, production crews I've been a part of. Everyone was just so um, inspired by him wanting to share this. So it was great. Awesome. You got, I, let me, I'm, I need to run like across the room because my computer is on 7%. Melanie, do not hate me. I forget. That's the one thing I forgot to do is plug in my computer. So give me two seconds, y'all. Okay. okay. Um, but before I go, actually, this is a, I can ask this question and we can go around the room while I grab my, um, my, my plug. Um, so we talked, I was saying, hearing you all talk about the relationship and meeting each other. Um, so you, when you're a filmmaker, you're a collaborator. Um, for those, we've heard um, Man in Hoodie story and the connection there. For other people, how have you connected um, or discovered your, the members of your team? And how do you, what, did, what are the things that you do to nurture those relationships and keep those relationships strong? And that's, that's to anyone.
<laughs> um, am I unmuted? Yeah, you're not muted. You're not muted. Go ahead. There we go. There okay. you are. Yeah. It's really confusing to me right now. I don't know why. Um, I would just say that Yaz has been um, a friend of mine. And when she brought me onto this project, I think um, she was so good as a director about just casting vision to everyone and making sure like I as a producer felt like I was on board with like what the film was about. And I, I think like um, since then I've continued to speak with and collaborate with Shamar and Yaz and, or at least be involved in projects. And I think a, a huge part of it is um, at least in this kind of storytelling is if you, if you really care about the human experience of something and, and you're passionate about your work, it's so amazing to bond over those two things. And I've known Yaz for a while, Shamar I met on set, but like, I don't know if this is answering your question correctly, but I just feel like, um, finding common ground about those two things as a creative and as a humanist, like it really um, makes those relationships very deep. And I feel really inspired and supported by these two. And yeah, that, that would be my experience. <laughs> forward to uh, more projects from you guys in the future. Um, so Ben Rana, for you, are you releasing more music? What's the, the, the next thing for you? What's coming next for you? Uh, of course. But um, my next project, uh, well, I've just released the project, Dead Emotions, my first EP uh, on my birthday of this year, uh, actually. And on it, um, it's, it consists of six songs. And I'm going to shoot, uh, I'm not sure how many, I'm going to say three right now, just a number grab. I'm going to say three. I think I'm going to shoot three visuals to it mm -hmm. um, this, well, this year. I mean, I put all of them out this year, but I will shoot three and try to shoot three this year. That's awesome. You're going to have them in the can ready to go. Okay, Top ready. one. <laughs> um, you know, we're all here at, at the Oxford Film Festival. Um, because, and this, this I'm going to kind of shift to questions for the audience and people who might be in the audience and want to hear from filmmakers who are out there doing it. So, you know, put that head on as we're, we're going into this. Um, this next kind of round of questions. So we're here at the Oxford Film Festival um, and you're here because of your work. What attributes do you think make a good filmmaker? And what do you do to nurture those attributes? I'll take that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would, you know, because I'm a, a documentary filmmaker, I say the first thing is being a good listener and listening to your community collaborators. Those are people you work with in your community and ask them, what's your story? And what do you want to tell? And just being there for them and listening. And it, it's, the, it's a process. A lot of the times I'm working as a single filmmaker. I don't have a crew, a lighting staff or an audio staff. It's just the community collaborators and myself. So I spend a great deal of time just listening to them and their concerns and then figuring out ways to, to tell their story on film. And that means going to community meetings, means going to church services, fish fries, whatever they're doing, you know, just being there. And I would say the second part is just showing up, being available. You know, right now we're in the middle of this pandemic and we've, we've seen the multiple um, protests honoring George Floyd and other people who've died at the hands of white supremacy and police brutality. And I think this pandemic has helped us pay attention more to those voices because we're sitting down, we're watching what's happening on the news, we're seeing it on social media live, we're hearing helicopters hover above us and we're seeing people participate in these protests. I think you just have to be available and open and be an active listener. That's just my take. No, absolutely, I agree with all of those things for sure. Um, I think in general, just it's hard to listen. That's 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 a a skill. <laughs> it, is a skill. <laughs> it is a skill. It really is. And so you know, to those who and 
So my background is also documentary filmmaking. And, um, you know, that's the, the, the thing you have to be, you know, in, in, in that particular space so that you can hear what they're saying and react to it and get to kind of the nuggets of their story, right? Because that's what, what they feed off of. And that's really how you kind of get into the depth of what's really happening and to get to them to their, their comfortable selves. And Ethan, you can probably speak to, to, to that, that bit of being an active listener in that documentary space. Um, uh, yeah, You're a great listener. So that, 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 those are great tips as far as what it takes to kind of nurture um, yourself as a filmmaker and, and specifically a documentary filmmaker. Shamar, I hear you laughing. What were you laughing at? <laughs> no, because it, it's the same thing in acting too, because you have to listen to how the person before you or your partner says their line and that'll inform you on how you say your line. Even though, even though the words are set, you might be like, you know, the line might be, I love you, right? And it's like, oh, I love you. Or it's like, I love you. I'm like, yeah, I love you too. You know what I mean? It's like, it's how you say it. It's, yeah. it's gotta, you gotta listen, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's, that's, that's how I was laughing. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's a skill. It is a skill. I am still learning. Like even in moderating, you know, um, it's, it's listening is like, you know, if you can do that well, you might be onto something, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure, uh, did anybody else want to add to that question before I move uh, forward? So I know, you know, the million dollar question <laughs> is how do you raise money <laughs> for your projects? Uh, everybody in every film festival audience has that question is, can you just talk a little bit about the process? I know Katrina and Ben Runner, I know I heard you talk about sponsors, uh, the AV sponsor, and I know a filmmaker there that didn't join us. I saw something in her credits that sparked that question for me. It's just like, what do you all do? Advice about fundraising. So go. <laughs> I'll I'll just say this um, for Man and Hoodie. The closest people around you are usually like your best source, to, like your best champions to help you raise money. Yeah. So I'll say that much. Yeah, family and friends for sure. Any mm -hmm. other creative um, outside of family and friends? What else, Megan? Go for it. Just in general, I've been working in the indie film sector for a while and um, haven't made a lot of money myself doing it, which is why I often bartend. But um, over the past few years and one time in 2011, I've, I've crowdfunded and, and asked for money like between my community as well. And accumulatively, wow, it's, I've raised, I think, around like somewhere between sixty and $70,000 just from my community for short films. Yeah. So I do think that it's about asking. If you don't ask, you don't get. So mm -hmm. finding a way to, to really explain why it's important. I think storytelling is one of the biggest catalysts for change. So I think if you can inspire people about why it's so important to share human experiences and stories, and if you have a good platform of what you're trying to share, um, you'll be surprised how much people will support you. Um, but it is about community yeah. for indie film. Awesome. Um, and, you know, kind of staying in, the, in this vein, uh, are there things that you all, um, videos that you watched, uh, classes that you took, um, pitch sessions that you attended that helped you prepare yourself before you went into the room to ask for money? Like, how do you prepare yourself? Um, and this, again, is to anybody who wants to answer it. Do you prepare yourself to to be comfortable asking for money? What are the things that you need to put in place or know kind of your elevator pitch? These are things that I've heard, but what are the things that you would say you need to have in place before you walk into the room and ask your community or anyone um, to support what you're trying to do? <laughs> well, here's what, here's what, here's what I'm gonna say. Am I the only producer on this or, I mean, Shamar, you're a producer as well, so. Yeah, well, that's fine. I, 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 this is a big question again, and, and, I'll, and I'll move on after, after we get through this bit. Okay. Shamar, do you wanna say something? No, you go ahead, you go ahead. I think you'll, you'll, say, you'll probably say it better. <laughs> um, every, every film is different. Um, I've, <clears throat> I've produced seven films and of every single film, I felt like I needed something different. So, um, I think that it depends on what the project is. And if the project is something that is, has a really strong social message, you go after different people than if it has a really strong, uh, and, and strong social messages can have strong, I would say commercial like potential, but if it has just, you know, like you kind of have to cater 
to what you're going after. Um, so if it's just festival driven, you're going after people who really just solely care about the arts and they're forecasting really great creative vision about your film. So having like a great, you know, um, way to, to explain why it's important, significant for the artist community. However, if it's um, something that you are hopefully doing a proof of concept for, you wanna make it into a feature, you think it has commercial potential, then you're going after probably investors or people who you're trying to build a relationship with for later financial support as well. So um, obviously an elevator pitch is important. And I think that having um, done your research and like, and I, I'm still learning in this myself, but it with, within your specific market of like, what, who is it that this appeals to and what is the potential it could have? There's so many platforms now too. I've had some films be on like Amazon um, Prime and like Shorts TV and a couple streaming services and there is potential, but there's still not a lot of money in it if, if it's short. So kind of seeing what the potential it, for it could be down the, down the road and being, um, clear that I think especially for short film it's it's really a lot of times just people believing in the arts uh if it's a feature or if it's a just when it was getting uh -oh. so it was getting so kind of good. Really your market. <laughs> yeah what, I, what do you hope to achieve is that okay <laughs> I'll stop there <laughs> Yeah, cool. Um, and, you know, you, you brought up this kind of distribute this idea of distribution and um, getting creative with those things. And speaking of um, just the film festival, we're here at a film festival. Why are film festivals important? And um, yeah, why are film festivals important? And how has coronavirus kind of, I know you your, your films were out on the circuit and going around, how has uh, COVID interrupted their festival run? And so, and, and how are you kind of, planning to kind of pivot from that is how is it changing what your plan is for um, distributing your film? Well, I'll just say that we are kind of coming at the tail end of our festival run okay. and we're moving on to getting uh, the series sold. So that's okay. where we are right now. Yeah. So it's going to, you're going, you're going to do, you are developing it into a series. Yes. Oh, that's exciting. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, let me see, what other questions do I have that the audience might be wondering about? Um, for, let's talk to Daquan. Daquan. Um, so it all starts with a script, um, but so when you're in the script writing process, how do you know when it's ready? Like, how do you know when it's ready to go into the world? Um, and how many films have you made actually? How many films have you made um, and your script writing process? How do you know when it's ready to shoot? I think I, I can't come up with a number, but I think I've made about like 10. Cause you know, I went to you know film school, we make films all the time. Um, but I would say this is like my first film outside of film school and academia in between actually. Um, and I think for this film in particular, I didn't ask anybody for notes when I wrote the draft, I just kind of wrote it and I was like, oh, okay, this works. And I think I had the story in mind and what I wanted to say. And I felt it was so personal. Like I didn't feel, um, that was what the, I'm writing a script that I'm gonna be shooting at the end of the month. And I definitely ask everybody for notes on that. Um, so I think it's about, I guess, my security and the story and my confidence in what it is that I'm writing. Um, yeah, so I'd say that. Awesome. And do you just build your confidence just from writing, just continually writing and just practicing in that way? Uh, I think so. I think I'm more moved by like what my vision is and how well I was able to communicate that. Okay. I think with um, the Butterflies film, the, the quote that I had from Du Bois that I used at the end, it was mm -hmm. something I referred back to whenever I would open up the script because that was my goal to like, you know, make sure that this quote or this spark what sparked the idea you know was so was felt in the word you know so that that was actually one of my questions is you did you just say the quote inspired your film it sparked the idea for your film or how how is the quote yeah how is it connected <laughs> why is that quote um, and, and it, quick, yeah let me just read the quote i think i wrote it down um uh <laughs> Somewhere here. Okay. Throughout history, the powers of single black men flash here and there like falling stars and die sometimes before the world has rightly gauged their brightness. 
Yeah, so that's a, a quote I read when I was obviously reading Souls of Black Folk when um, his book. Um, and I think that's something I've always kept because I've been working on trying to write a longer piece. And so to me, this was... Oh no. Uh oh It's getting uh -oh. good. We lost him. No. Hopefully he'll come back. Um, uh, if he comes right back, I would hate to interrupt that flow because I think he was in yeah. a. <laughs> All right, there he is. I think he's connecting. All right, so we'll, we'll let him finish and then Ethan, I have a question for you. All right. What were you saying? Um, sorry, um, my phone died. Um, but I was saying um, that was something, a quote that I had, I was using for like a longer um, feature. Um, so for this one, I kind of kept it in mind as um you know um my guiding principle so ethan, ethan for you um do you have any plans of documenting any future generations of quilters to kind of keep continue down the, the the path of that telling that particular story or capturing that particular history and heritage um i honestly i honestly don't um lou and i have kept in touch a little bit but um I'm not sure there are any more currently after her. And I know that she spent a lot of time away from the, the practice and decided to go back at another age. Um, but yeah, I honestly, I honestly haven't thought about it. I made the film about a year ago. And um, yeah, like I said, a lot of other people have made the film too. And I also feel like there's room for, there's, plenty of room for other voices to go in and tell their stories um, because I think I think a lot of the older generation that are still alive like their stories are still still need to be told too but um, I don't I'm not sure I'm the one to do it right now I feel like my time with Lou was the time that I'll spend out there yeah. well you did a great job then and uh, we're Thanks out in the world now. Um, so kind of speaking, we're, we're kind of coming to a, a end. I'm just um, interested to know what's next for the folks who haven't shared that um, post coronavirus, like what are you doing now? What is, did you have a film plan that had to stop? Kind of what's next for, for everyone? I'm currently still working. Uh, still doing music. Um, possibly gonna release another project later this year before the year is out, probably November, December. Um, but one of the videos, you know, one of, one of the visuals and videos be shot clear until like next week. Okay. Uh, shows have been put on hold because of no corona or whatever. Right. Uh, so basically I'm just adding to my inventory until to the opening big up. What's, what's next for you, Katrina? Um, I've just been slowly getting back to work. I've been doing some reality TV work. Um, just had a shoot in Alabama for a few days in the woods. Uh, so just slowly getting back to work on sets, which I'm excited about. So. Awesome. I think I saw that on social media. Great picture. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yoshi, what's next for you? So I've been documenting the Black Lives Matter protests and the coronavirus pandemic here in the Bay Area, but I'm currently writing a pitch to work on what's like being black in America and just listening to what the protesters have been saying during, the, during these actions and going beyond that and documenting what defunding police looks like and where are the black men you know we have the highest incarcerated <laughs> incarcerated um black population in the world so what does that look like mm -hmm. so right now it's pretty broad but i'm just listening and hopefully I could find some sources and and find the spaces where i can shoot those stories yes megan what's next for you guys Oh, well, we're definitely doing the series next. Um, we've got our uh, the pitch deck ready and we're just waiting on meetings um, right now. Zoom meetings, because, you know, Corona. 
<laughs> but um, <laughs> in the meantime, while I'm waiting for these Zoom meetings, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to start writing uh, episodes. I've already finished two episodes. Um, I have a friend, Mark Cherry, who did uh, Desperate Housewives and, and, and Golden Girls. And he was like, listen, the less work you have to make Hollywood do, the easier it is for them to say yes to you. <laughs> okay, so you just keep writing every episode, homie. Keep doing it. Just keep going. <laughs> It's very true. The more you have, the you know, the more they can draw from. Because you know, once there's more heads in the game, it's gonna be changed and edited anyway. But if you have a really good base that you come with, uh, it's very much appreciated because it's less work for them. Um, right. I'm also uh, I'm also a writer, so I write and direct um, uh, usually my projects. So I am currently. Uh, just uh, kind of at the finishing development of a feature script, I developed a script in the Sundance writing lab. And so I'm just kind of like over the next three months finishing up that script. And then I have another script um, for a feature film that is already done kind of with the first draft. So I'm gonna go back and work on that too. So I'm just using the time to do all of the homework basically <laughs> the creative side and on, on, on that and until we can start filming again hopefully next year again what, what's next for you um i am producing another short film that is also proof, proof of concept for a series um in new york next month with a lot of strict covid constraints it's gonna be really interesting much smaller crew um Definitely the nature of indie films changing a little bit right now, because if you want to be responsible, you know, we already normally run with skeleton crews, but we don't always have the finances to be as um, strategic about, you know, um, the crisis. So we have to be even thinner in our um, crew. So I'm doing that and I'm just working with as many creatives as I can to support what they've got going on right now. And um, my brother is also a director writer. So just trying to collaborate and keep the juices flowing and wait for what's next. Awesome. Um, Ethan or Daquan, either one. What's next for you guys? Oh. <laughs> um. Um, I, I said I think I said earlier, but I'm shooting a short at the end of this month. Okay. Um, so working on that again, a lot of COVID reg regulations and like changing the script so it can fit a lot of the guidelines that we have here in New York. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm excited about that. Um, and then I'll be doing a lot of writing. Awesome. Ethan, um, actually going to be in Oxford in a couple weeks to shoot a couple short documentaries. Um, and uh, hopefully I'm holding up in, down in Florida if Georgia still remains worse than Florida to edit. Uh, my producing partner and I, she and I are gonna get a house and start editing post-production for our first full-length film. Hopefully if she and her husband get back from Spain in time. So um, wow. that, and then I'm working on a a bunch of short documentaries uh, following Lonnie Holly. He's an Atlanta artist and musician. So all kinds of, it's been a lot of, had a lot of time to sit in front of the editing station. <laughs> yeah, um, editing is, uh, I've, I've, I've worst. appreciated over the years. I've, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. It's not the worst actually, it's not the worst. <laughs> you know in moments it definitely is is painful <laughs> and i know we can all uh, we all understand it what it's like uh, understand what it's like to sit in, in the editor's seat um being independent filmmakers and so um just to kind of close it out um anybody who wants to throw something in um in the head or the bucket here just advice for future filmmakers um what is your piece of advice uh, that you would want filmmakers to take away from our conversation or just from um, the work that you do. So just a piece of advice that you'll offer as we close out uh, our conversation tonight. Follow your vision. Simple. Follow your vision. Yeah, I was going to say that to follow your vision, find your vision, find who, what your voice is, what you want to tell, what stories you're interested in. And if you're a writer and director, um, obviously even more so. But I think in any, any part of um, crew, no matter what you are, um, if you're really passionate about that and you really want to do it, learn, learn, read, educate yourself as much as possible. 
right now there's so much free information and learning and education out there on the internet that you can just suck it all in. I mean, it, it's right. the more you know, the more you know, the better off you are, you know, and the more you know, the more independent you are to be on your own feet and do something. Mm -hmm. And so I would say learn, educate, read everything that you can. Awesome. Agreed. I would say the same thing as, as far as even writing. There's times where I'm like writing uh, like a scene and I go, I don't even know what that is. Google, what's that? <laughs> oh, that happens? Oh, well, oh, I'm putting that in. <laughs> I, would, I would piggyback off of that and say that no matter what your role is in film, to try to learn as much as you can, especially in indie film about every different role. Um, I've always been super interested in anything about writing or development of the story or the characters or the acting. I'm primarily a producer, but I found that as I jump into some of these other roles or I get my feet wet in different things, whatever you do, it'll make you better at the role that you have because it is such a team effort. And the more that you speak the language of your teammates, the better um, the product will be in the end. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Any other um, tips, Yoshi? Yeah, I would say never lose your childlike curiosity. <laughs> yeah. And That's never cool. give up, ever. Um, okay. surround, you, surround yourself with people who always lift you up, people you can learn for, from, find mentors, uh, follow your favorite directors on social media, and hit their DMs <laughs> and try to intern for them. Yeah, try to find a way in, into the door and study. I constantly view documentaries all the time and I have my journal and I'm writing notes and like, oh, I like how they did that. I wonder how they shot that. And usually I'll just send a quick message to them and, and ask. So. And pretty much uh, everyone's responded back to me. That's awesome. So be fearless, filmmakers who are out there listening. Be fearless. Katrina? Those mouths don't get fed. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> right. And also, I would say just be like super open and friendly to everybody that you meet everywhere. Because I was literally in line at Walgreens checking out the other day and met another person in Grenada, Mississippi that's like working on a show somewhere. So I was, you know, just talk to everybody. Be friendly. <laughs> relationships uh, be open be fearless don't give up on your vision write um, stay inspired google google it <laughs> um, <laughs> with that y'all with the smiles on our face i just want to say thank you so much on behalf of the oxford film festival and on the half on behalf of the state of mississippi on the on behalf of independent black film collective all of these things i appreciate all of your thoughts, ideas, and conversation tonight and sharing with me and the filmmakers that are tuning in. We appreciate each of you and best of everything wishes to you and all of your future endeavors. Um, thanks so much. And I look forward to seeing more of your projects out in the world. All right, y'all. And with that, I'm going to say good night. Good night. Good night. Likewise. Good night, Tabby.